Morning folks, welcome back to the last part of higher chemistry rates of reaction topic. So far we have covered um, relative rate, we have covered um, when you need to use relative rate, how to calculate it, the units that are in. We took a look at collision theory, which is the idea behind why we can change the rates of reaction. We also took a deeper dive into catalysts and how they work. The mystery of how they manage to speed up chemical reactions, excuse me, <coughs> without getting used up in them. We went into the concept of activation energy, activated complexes. We came up with reaction progression uh, curves, um, where we had uh, energy stored in the bonds at the side um, versus time, effectively. Uh, I said potential energy. There's a few different labels you can put here. Potential energy was the most common one. I actually gave you the proper name for it, which is called enthalpy. Um, uh, and down here is progress. Um, today, in the last part of this, I'd like to look at something called uh, energy distribution graphs. I didn't want to put it into the last one because there was loads of graphs that we've covered already, graph overload time. Um, but this uh, is an interesting concept and it answers a question which I know has kept you awake at night uh, for years now, which is, for example, glass of water here, room temperature, probably 21, boiling point of water, well, obviously 100 Celsius under normal conditions. So how does the water evaporate then? How does that work? If I pour some water out, not about to, but if I pour some water out and leave it for a few hours, I come back and it's gone. It's, it has turned into a gas, and yet there doesn't seem to be enough energy in this room to do that. Mm. Right, okay. So, energy distribution graphs. Um, where do these occur? These occur most often, uh, in my experience, and <coughs> I apologise again, energy distribution graphs. Um, they occur... In multiple choice, um, they would seem to be a, a favourite possibility for the open-ended questions. This would be a great open-ended topic because you can throw graphs and diagrams and explanations all together. Please remember, by the way, for your open-ended questions, don't feel you have to slog yourself to death writing a huge big three sets of paragraphs to get the three marks. Diagrams and uh, label diagrams and concepts will do just as well. Um, what is an energy distribution graph? A question uh, that I answered earlier on. What was temperature again? We measure it as hot or cold, but in the microscopic world, it is the average kinetic energy for a bunch of molecules. So I pop through, get my meat thermometer, which I will do actually, two things. Okay. Pop it in a glass of water. Let that cool down. Um, so, what was temperature again? Temperature is the average kinetic energy of any particular sample of, uh, of atoms. My uh, glass of water is sitting here crashing down towards 10 Celsius. Um, just put another ice cube in it so that will continue to drop. But that means that the average kinetic energy in that glass is a certain level. You notice I keep emphasising average. The brighter amongst you might already have sussed the answer to my question about evaporating water. Um, because it turns out that if you plot a different graph now, I did say energy distribution graphs. So if we plot number of molecules against kinetic energy this time, in other words, temperature. Let's go with that, let's go. So effectively, this is low temperature, this is high temperature you get a curve that looks like this. Now this is called a normal distribution curve. It applies to all sorts of things, interestingly. It applies to um, intelligence, it applies to height, <laughs> where you'd have number of people versus height here, in which case, of course, you would find me there. Um, but anyway, enough about height jokes. Um, how does this correspond to, um, to chemistry? What do you need to know? Well. Because this is kinetic energy, uh, and the last topic we looked at what was required to, the minimum energy required to start any given chemical reaction was a number of kilojoules per mole. That was called the activation energy, of course. That means that it will appear, the activation energy will be a number somewhere on this scale. Say, for example, there. 
Now, because it's a number on the scale, that means it has a value, like that. Now, so what? Well, that means for this particular chemical reaction that we're looking at, the only molecules which could possibly react are in this area under the curve. So these are the molecules which currently can react. So what are these energy distribution graphs? What's the point of them? They are a different way of explaining um, why temperature, concentration, um, and a catalyst affect reaction rates. Um, on the next page, I'm going to try. I'm going to try in three different colours. I'm going to go back to those three explanations. Let me just pause the video for a second, please. Right, folks. We're going to look at three factors affecting um, rate of reaction. I think we'll start with the simplest one, which is concentration. So, if we have in black here our original um, chemical, uh, sorry. If we have in black here our original distribution curve, I apologise, um, and if we uh, plot the kinetic energy in hopefully approximately the same place as it did in the last sheet, then you can see, as we said before, that only this number of molecules can possibly react, because that's the definition of the activation energy. I'd like to help if you labelled it. Activation energy. Um, now, what we're going to do now is increase the concentration. Uh, now, how do we do that? How do we show increased concentration? Well, this scale, of course, is the number of molecules. So if we were to increase the number of molecules, then you would have a curve that looks perhaps like this. Um, please note... Uh, not immediately obvious on my dodge, I just threw the top of a pen there, that helps. Um, so if it's not immediately obvious in my diagram, this point here, which is the most common kinetic energy, will be the temperature. So that's my glass of water showing at about 11 Celsius. So this is the temperature. You note the same apex point there, I haven't changed the temperature, I've simply increased the number of molecules, so we shifted that graph upwards. And now, hopefully, you can see that we have a little more. Uh, number of molecules able to react. So we have speeded up the chemical reaction, not by a massive amount, but we have done it. And that tallies with the linear graph, of course, that we found for rate versus concentration. Let's do the second variable. Just pause this again. My apologies, folks, just before I leave this one behind, I just realised that I didn't make that crystal clear. Very sloppy of me. So, in blue, this is us increasing the concentration Therefore, you can see there are more molecules, compared to the black one anyway, um, there are more molecules with greater than or equal to activation energy. Those are the molecules that can react, um, and therefore we find a slightly faster reaction. Not a huge increase, but it's still there. Um, now, we're going to change temperature. Um, so, increased temperature. How, again, we're going to go, ironically, Slightly confusingly in blue, sorry. It's not meant to be colder, it's meant to be hotter. Um, we're going to shift this curve. Now, the last time, we kept the apex at the same point because we were not increasing the temperature. Big hint. Uh, that's not going to happen this time. Uh, and we move the curve upwards. Now, in this case, if this is our original temperature here for the beaker, then we're going to crank the temperature up. That means this apex is going to have to drift to the right slightly. There's a technical reason why you'll see in a lot of books not only do the drift to the right, the apex, but they also spread the cone out as well. I'm not going to go into the reason behind that, you don't need to know it. But if you if you see in the books, that's that's why. So I'm going to shift the apex to the right slightly. And just because it's the right thing to do, I'm also going to flatten this cone out slightly. Um, now, before, at the original temperature was here, we could only have this area reacting. And I'm hoping that now you can see a bare difference. We've got all this. So increased temperature, uh, you've got a lot more molecules. With greater than or equal to the activation energy. And therefore you have a much faster reaction. That also ties in. Remember, nonlinear. The more temperature you give it, the very much faster it gets. This is why. 
this is where you can see the difference. Um, and the last one is a catalyst. Now this is the one the SQA would love to give you a sort of trick, a uh, multiple choice one with. They'll give you these before and after curves and they'll ask which one applies to a catalyst. Now, number, let me pause this. It's no fun watching me draw stuff. And we're back. Right, so same curve again. Now, um, this is a slightly oddball one because in the last two situations, we have changed the property of the chemicals that are reacting. We either had more molecules or we shifted this to the right because the temperature, the average kinetic energy of the beaker was increased. In this case, if you remember exactly what a catalyst does, I said last time it reduces the activation energy. So just for a change, this line, this value here is going to shift that way. So if we reduce, say we halved the activation energy down to about there. Wow, okay. Now, that was the number of molecules before. <laughs> this is the number of molecules now. That's why catalysts are so beloved um, by industry and by, of course, uh, biological systems keeping us alive because they can hugely increase uh, the reaction rate. So, um, the, these today were energy distribution graphs, not to be confused with uh, progress of reaction graphs. or indeed rate of reaction graphs. Um, there's lots of graphs in this topic. I did mention that before. Uh, so not to be confused with graphs like this. Are they even related to them at all? No, they are not related to them at all. They, sh they do show a s the same concept though, because if you remember before I said activation energy was from wherever you started on this potential energy um, scale up to the highest point. So that was our activation energy. It gives you a number, a value of the activation energy. Um, this shows you the consequence of that activation energy on these curves. Um, and that's all I'd like to say. Thank you for listening.